What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today is the second installment of my uh, little mini series here on Czech lager styles. Today we're doing the Czech Amber Lager, which is a super underrated beer. Czech Amber Lager is a really hard beer style to find because you really don't see it outside of places that really specialize in Czech Lager. It's a style that's typically known as Polo Tomavi or half dark basically in Czech. Um, and it's something that's really, really cool in the way that it manifests itself. It's a beautiful like just amber rich color with loads of the maltiness you expect from Czech Lagers, but also pumped up with quite a few hops as well. And that really nice special noble sots character that is so, so distinctive of Czech lagers. And today's example of it is going to be double decoction mashed, uh, as is pretty traditional for these beers, but more on that later. Before we jump into the recipe, I just want to give a quick shout out to a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, who provided the ingredients for this batch of beer, and secondly, Clawhammer Supply, whose system I'll be brewing this one on today. Today I'm using the 10 gallon 240 volt system. For the recipe on this one, this is going to be a bit stronger than the uh, 10 degree Play-Doh uh, Czech Pale Lager that I brewed a few weeks back. This one is going to be more of a 14 degree Play-Doh beer. So we're looking at an OG of around 1057. In order to get there, we're going to start out with a good base malt, good Czech Pilsner malt. Um, and last time I used Prostiov malts uh, Pilsner malt, which was absolutely fantastic. I wanted to experiment though and see if I could pick up any difference between the Prostiov malts and uh, your typical Weirman floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt, which is what I'm going to be using here today. I'm going to be starting out with 10 pounds of Weirman floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt, and then we're going to be adding to that one pound of Kara Munich 2 from Weirman. This is a really delicious malt that's going to give a boost in the final gravity to the beer. It's going to give a little bit of sweetness to it, and when combined with a decoction mash, it's going to really unlock a ton of really nice, rich, malty flavor that's going to really support this beer quite a bit. Then we're going to add that one pound of Weirman Munich 1, which is going to give toastiness and body to this beer. It's also going to help increase the, uh, the amount of melanoidins we get out of the decoction mash. Uh, when you decoction mash Munich malt, you really get a massive amount of flavor out of that. And then finally, to dial in the color on this beer, and this is exactly how you're gonna get that perfect amber color, we're adding one ounce of Weirman Carafa Special 3. This is a dehusked uh, roasted malt, but by adding one ounce of it, and specifically at the very end of the mash, we'll get that really beautiful red hue in the beer without adding any sort of roasted flavors to it. Adding a small amount of roasted malt to the beer to get a really nice amber color is something you see in a lot of amber beers. It's a really great recipe trick. It's a much cleaner way to get a beautiful red color in the beer without extra sweetness so that you don't have to use things like crystal malt to get that color instead. For the hops in this beer, we're actually driving the IBU levels quite high. I'm actually targeting the upper end of the range of the style guidelines, going for about 34th to 35 IBUs uh, for overall bitterness. But we're adding a lot of hops to the late boil because this is a huge part of the flavor of Czech lagers. So we're actually going to be starting out with a bittering edition of Sterling instead. I used all Sterling in my Czech Pale Lager and it was absolutely fantastic. Sterling has a very similar flavor palette to Sots, but it has a very high alpha acid uh, concentration relative to your typical Noble Sots. So it's very useful for the bittering side, but don't be afraid to use it as a flavor hop either. But in this case, I am going to be using it on the bittering side. We're going to be doing a first wort hopping edition with one ounce of Sterling then, at 30 minutes, I'm going to add Sots, your typical classic Czech hop. Um, it is a classic for a reason. It is something that works so well in these beers and provides a very specific flavor of that spice and that herbal character that is so critical for Czech lagers. So we're adding a lot of it in. We're adding one ounce at 30 minutes. We're adding one ounce at 15 minutes. We're adding one ounce at 10 minutes and one ounce at zero minutes. So a lot of hops going into this beer and it should manifest itself really nicely and balance out all that maltiness we get. For the water profile in this beer, um, Typically, with the Czech lager, the guidance is to go very, very soft, and that is actually what I'm still doing today. Most of the time, you're taking regular spring water or tap water and cutting that down with distilled water or just getting as soft of water as you possibly can. With my Czech pale lager, I used straight reverse osmosis water with nothing added to it, and it turned out beautiful. The hop character was super delicate. Everything was really, really nice in the way it presented. Um, and I could do that again. There's plenty of Czech breweries across the entire country that have harder water than Pilsen though. And Czech Amber Lager is brewed across the country. 
So there's no reason to really dedicate yourself to a super soft water profile unless, like me, you're planning that recipe out so that you can get as delicate of hop flavor as possible. So I am gonna be starting out with a base of eight gallons of reverse osmosis water, but I'm gonna be adding to that one gram each of gypsum and calcium chloride. So at the end of it, my water profile is 18 parts per million of calcium, zero parts per million of magnesium, eight parts per million of sodium, 20 parts per million of chloride, 19 parts per million of sulfate, and 16 parts per million of bicarbonate. And I actually do have a little bit of residual mineral in the RO water. That's why those numbers are a little bit higher than you might expect. Overall though, shouldn't have too big of an impact, but the point here is to keep the water relatively soft, but don't feel like you have to have straight zero parts per million of everything. For the yeast in this one, I'm gonna be going with the Pilsner Urquell D strain. This is Y yeast 2278. With a Czech pale lager, I used the Pilsner Urquell H strain, which was OYL 101 from Omega. It had a fantastic result, left lots of malt flavor behind, but it was a little bit more attenuative. This particular strain is actually a little less attenuative and it's a little dirtier. So we're gonna get a little bit more yeast character out of it, which is important because I actually wanna try a little bit of a open fermentation experiment with this one. And like at the most traditional level, Czech lagers are actually open fermented. Um, and it's a little tricky to pull it off, but I'm gonna try it this time and see how it goes. Either way, I've used the D strain before when I made a Czech dark lager and the result was absolutely amazing. Uh, so I'm gonna try it again, and I really think that that extra maltiness that that strain pushes forward is gonna really, really benefit this beer. And last but certainly not least for the mash, we're doing a double decoction mash. For the Czech Pale Lager, I showed you how to fit a single decoction into a mash schedule, but today we're gonna be fitting a double decoction into the same mash schedule. It's a little trickier, so there's a little bit more kind of going on at the same time. The basic mash schedule is a Hoke Kurtz style step mash with a protein rest on the beginning. You don't need a protein rest, but what this does is it gives me a little bit extra time to get that first decoction moving along and you'll need that time. So starting out with a protein rest for 10 minutes at 131 degrees, then stepping up to a 30 minute rest at 148 degrees, then stepping up to a 30 minute rest at 158 degrees, and then finally finishing off with a mash out for 15 minutes at 170 degrees. Now this is how the decoction schedule fits into that. When we start the protein rest, I'm gonna pull out one third of the thick mash, which usually ends up being about 12 quarts uh, for the decoction. We're gonna start raising that up to boiling temperatures, but in the process of raising to the boil, we're going to have a short pause at about 150 degrees to complete the conversion of the grain that's in that decoction. It's a very high grain to water ratio, so that conversion doesn't take very long at all. The protein rest is only gonna last for 10 minutes and then it'll continue on into the beta amylase rest, that 148 degree step. And that process is gonna be automated because I have an electric system. So the entire time the protein rest and the beta rest is going on, I'm gonna be working this decoction, bringing it up to boiling and boiling it probably 15 minutes until the end of that first beta rest the 148 degree Fahrenheit rest. Once the beta rest is complete, once the decoction's finished boiling, I'll take it and return it all into the main mash tun. That should actually step it up right to the next temperature of 158. And I'll then repeat the entire process. I'll take out 12 more quarts of decoction, put it into a separate kettle, put it on the burner and boil that thing for another 15 minutes or so uh, until the alpha amylase rest, the 158 degree rest is completed. At that time, remove everything else from the decoction kettle, put it back into the main mash, stir it up. We should be at our mash out temperature by then and it should go along pretty well. Now there's a few things I wanna talk about here. First of all, if this sounds complicated to you, that's because it is. It's not necessary to do a decoction mash for this beer. You could absolutely get away with doing a step mash plus some melanoid and malt or just a single infusion mash at 152 degrees plus a melanoid and malt. We'll get the job done for you as well. This is just something I enjoy doing. It's something that is traditional and these beers just taste a lot better to me when I put the effort in. That's how I like to brew and there's no reason why you need to do it the same exact way. Uh, brew the way you want to brew, but if you want to do this, then more power to you because it's just fun. This is the exact same process and mash schedule that I use for my Czech Dark Lager. So if you're curious about it, definitely check that video out, but also check out the video that's gonna pop up in the corner right now where I teach you how to actually do this process in a lot more detail so that you can actually figure out how to do it for yourself. It's not too hard, but it definitely is a little complicated, but again, it's a lot of fun. Anyway, guys, I love these beers. I'm dying to get it started and I'm actually kind of behind schedule. So let's go ahead and get brewing. 
I started out by collecting eight gallons of reverse osmosis water in my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat it up to the protein rest temperature of 131 degrees Fahrenheit. As the strike water was heating up, I also uh, measured out my one gram each of calcium chloride and gypsum uh, and added those into the strike water as it was heating up. And I also milled out all of my grain, separately milling the Carafa Special 3. Little hint for Carafa 3, it has no husks, so sometimes uh, it doesn't really grab the mill rollers very well and it won't crush. So I just recommend tossing in a handful of two row or Pilsner malt with it if you're crushing it separately. Once I reach the strike temperature for the protein rest, I dote in with everything except for the Carafa 3, mixed it up very thoroughly, and then immediately started to pull out thick mash for my first decoction. I pulled out about 12 quarts of thick mash for the first decoction and put it into my uh, old mega pot that I still use as a decoction kettle. I was targeting a pretty thick uh, grist to liquor ratio in the decoction itself, so just enough liquid to basically just cover the top of the grains. And then I took the kettle over to the side burner on my gas grill and started to heat it up to the decoction sacrification rest temperature of about 150 degrees or about 66 Celsius. I hit that sacrification range on my decoction about the same time that it was time to step up to the first rest in the mash of 148 degrees Fahrenheit. So I used my electric system to automatically step up to that temperature and not hold the protein rest too long while my decoction simultaneously continued to heat up to boiling. I stirred the decoction thoroughly, making sure to scrape anything off of the bottom to avoid scorching and gradually heated it up to boiling and boiled the decoction for about 15 minutes before returning it to the main mash to step up to the next rest temperature. So once I returned everything into the main mash, it was time to step up to the next step of 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I mixed in my entire decoction and that brought us close to that target temperature, but not quite all the way there. So I again used the electric system to correct the temperature. At the same time, I pulled out my second decoction, which again was another 12 quarts of thick mash. I filled up my uh, old mega pot kettle one more time, took it back over to the side burner on the grill, and went directly up to boiling temperatures, which took another 15 minutes. Again, I boiled for another 15 minutes in this case. Decoction mashing can be a pretty long process, especially if there's multiple decoctions involved, so I grabbed a beer and put on an episode of the Brewlosophy podcast to kill the time. Once the second decoction was complete, I returned it into the main kettle and that brought everything up to about 170 degrees, which was our target mash out temperature. It was at this time that I also added in my one ounce of Carafa Special 3, being sure to thoroughly mix that in and make everything uniform before letting the mash out rest for about 15 minutes. Once the mash out was complete, I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for about 15 minutes. And I also added in my one ounce of Sterling as first wort hops. I let the grain basket drain for about 15 minutes and also gradually raised up the heat to a boil. Once I hit the boil, I didn't add anything, but I started a 60 minute timer. And at the 30 minute mark, I added one ounce of sots. At the 15 minute mark, I added one more ounce of sots. At the 10 minute mark, I also added one more ounce of sots. And I also added in a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. And then lastly, at the zero minute mark, I finally added one more ounce of sots. I started a quick whirlpool to just get the hop debris all piled up in the center of the kettle before transferring over through my counterflow chiller, chilling in the process to get us down to a target pitch temperature of about 50 degrees. Uh, I did not get all the way down to that pitch temperature in the first pass. I let it continue to cool down in the brew build X2 uh, for the next several hours until we got down to our target pitch temperature. At this point, I pitched in my starter of Yeast 2278, and then I took an original gravity sample, pleasantly surprised to find myself at 1058, which was actually one point higher than our target OG. Uh, we'll make the beer slightly stronger, but all in all, it ended up being a great brew day, albeit quite a tiring one. At this point, I put in a dry airlock as I intended to open ferment this beer for the first several days. So for the fermentation on this beer, there's several different choices you have if you want to stick with Czech yeast. And they generally are sourced from the following places. Two of them from Pilsner Urkel and one of them from Budvar. The Pilsner Urkel selections are split into either the Pilsner Urkel D strain, which is what I'll be using today, or the H strain. 
and the Budvar selection is its own thing. The Pilsner Urquell D strain is typically available as Y yeast 2278, which I'll be using today, or Imperial L28 Urkel. The H strain, on the other hand, is available as Y yeast 2001, Omega OYL 101, and White Labs WLP 800. The Budvar strain is available as Y yeast 2000 or White Labs WLP 802. In order for the heart and soul of this beer to still be what it's supposed to be, I highly recommend you use a Czech lager yeast. If you can't find a Czech lager yeast though, that's okay. You can use something like a Southern German lager yeast, a Munich lager strain, that will get the job done as well. What I would not recommend using is something like Kvike, uh, because that will actually attenuate too far, and I'd also not recommend using W3470. I've done that before and it makes a fine tasting beer, but it will over attenuate the beer and you're gonna be left with a lot less malt character than you might have expected. For dry yeast, I'd recommend Diamond Lager. If you're using a Czech Lager yeast like me, I really would recommend keeping the temperature on that colder side. Uh, these yeasts really are not very temperature tolerant and when it comes down to it, they need to be between 48 and 55 degrees really to do the best they can. Um, they are not the world's cleanest lager yeast, like I've said before, so they do tend to throw out a lot of diacetyl. They will throw out a ton of banana esters as well if you get them too hot. Uh, so really just try to keep that temperature steady, try to keep it low, or pressure ferment these beers to get the best out of the yeast. If you are pressure fermenting them, beware of excess pressure because it can really stress the yeast out. Then you get sulfur character out of them, um, and that's not really good for business. Low and slow is the name of the game for these beers. They do take their time. They're gonna need extra time on the yeast to clean things up. It's just beneficial overall to be patient with them. They will reward you in the end for it. Now, I've made a lot of Czech lagers and I'm also fortunate to have had a lot of really good Czech lagers. At least in the US here, I live near some of the best lager breweries in the nation with the likes of Notch Brewing and Jack's Abbey right down the road. Now, Notch does something that's really fun where they actually traditionally open ferment their lagers. And this is something I have never tried before, despite making a lot of these beers in the past. And I'd like to try it this time. So I've open fermented once before when I made a Belgian Pilsner and it really released a ton of yeast character that actually benefited the beer. You don't need to open ferment your beer, but it is kind of like a cool nod to tradition. And if I'm already a decoction mashing this thing and using all the traditional ingredients, then what the hell, I might as well open ferment the beers while I'm at it. Just to summarize, what I'll be doing is I'm gonna be open fermenting this beer with Y yeast 2278 Czech Pils, the Pilsner Urkel D strain, fermenting it at about 48 degrees Fahrenheit for about two weeks or so. The way I'm gonna open ferment this is with a dry airlock. This is an easy way to keep debris uh, from falling into the beer and bugs from flying into the beer as it's fermenting. And then essentially once that third or fourth day is complete, when the Krausen starts to fall down, then I will just just fill the airlock with the sanitizer and carry on as usual. Now, typically with these Czech lager strains, they're gonna throw out a ton of diacetyl in the process. I'd recommend holding a diacetyl rest at the end of your fermentation, bringing the temperature up to room temperature slowly and gradually and holding it there for two or three days to let the yeast metabolize the diacetyl. However, um, I have a little trick that I use that is definitely not traditional, uh, and that is using ALDC enzyme uh, to limit the production of diacetyl. This stuff is great. It's a straight up cheat code. A couple drops of that at uh, the beginning of fermentation and there's no diacetyl in the beer for the rest of its life. It's awesome. Once that fermentation is complete, I'll keg and I'm gonna lager it in my keg, um, in the back of my kegerator basically until it's ready, which should be like three to four weeks probably. Um, and I'm not gonna use any findings. I'm just gonna let it naturally clear and we'll see what happens. So I will catch you guys when it's all ready in a few weeks and until then, cheers. The fermentation for this beer went quite typically for a lager of this type. It took about two weeks to get us down to our final gravity of 1012. 1012 is a bit lower than Brewfather predicted that it would go. It does put us at 6% ABV though, which is a little higher than style guidelines. Um, and thus it might take a bit longer to clarify, but nonetheless, I'm quite happy with the results. I actually ended up doing about four days of open fermentation. And then uh, as I saw the CO2 production begin to decrease, I stuck a filled airlock on there instead of a dry airlock and allowed the fermentation to complete in that state. Because I added ALDC at yeast pitch, I didn't have to do a diacetyl rest for this one. So once the fermentation was complete, I just immediately transferred into a keg and started the lagering process, keeping it in the back of my kegerator at a nice cold temperature and allowing it to naturally clarify over time. Several weeks later, it was ready to serve. The beer is called Pivo Napodzim, and it comes in 
at 6.0% ABV and 34 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it is pouring an absolutely stunning, rich, just deep red color that is so, so visually pleasing. Uh, it is absolutely perfectly crystal clear. No findings were used in this, and it turned out beautifully clear in about four weeks of lagering. This beer is beautiful. I cannot begin to express to you how much I enjoy pouring it into this dimpled mug to actually show off what kind of light play it has. It's so cool to see what the highlights look like when the glass is being moved around. It's, it's just a really good combination of beer, color, and glass. The head on the beer is pouring a luscious whipped cream-like texture coming off of that Lucre faucet, and it has a really nice, uh, slightly off-white, somewhat beige color to it. It lasts for a really, really long time, eventually collapsing. It just gives a really wonderful drinking experience. All right, so now it's going for aroma. So off of the aroma, I'm um, getting a lot of earthiness. Uh, very much, very strong with the earthiness character on this one. I'm getting some nuttiness as well. Um, and then there's a hint of like an estery fruity character, but overall very, very much earthy, nutty character. Yeah, so. Uh, it's kind of hard with this glass, but you know, this is the right way to do this. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. Mouthfeel on this is very similar to the previous Czech beer that I made, the Czech Pale Lager. It's soft. It's got no edges to it. It's all rounded. It's got such a delicate character. It's like super soft and easy drinking. As I mentioned before, it's not really crisp. And the reason for that is because there's not very much in the water at all, but that's the way these beers are meant to present themselves. In my opinion, Czech lagers really shouldn't be crispy. They shouldn't have hard edges to them. German lagers should, because the water profile is very different there. But the Czech lagers, have a certain magical quality about them when the water profile is so light that yes they're not crisp but they are still very refreshing and what happens is the hop flavor and the hop character that is such an integral part of these beers because we are hopping them to 30 ibus you know and that's a lot for a lager that hop character manifests itself so differently with a soft water profile that if it had more minerals in it and that edge and that crispiness it would make it extra bitter and that's not necessarily something that we want out of these beers. Yes, there's bitterness in them, but there's tons of flavor and there's tons of hop character. It only works that way when you have a soft water profile. As always, when you're pouring these beers, the Luger faucet, it just changes everything about the texture and it gives it this silkiness. It gives it, it just emphasizes that soft, delicate character and makes it so worth it. Body-wise, this beer is exactly where I want it. It's about like a medium to medium light body on it. Still has a little bit of substantial character to emphasize the maltiness to get you what you want out of something that's more than a light pale lager, but still highly refreshing and highly quaffable uh, for being what it is. And I'm actually impressed because it's like 6% and it's still incredibly drinkable. So now it's going for flavor because this beer has quite a lot. <laughs> It's interesting, this beer didn't quite come out the way I expected, but not in a bad way necessarily. So first and foremost, what I get out of the flavor on this one is a ton of hop flavor. Um, it took me a long time to really identify exactly what was going on with the flavor on this one, but this batch of sots that I have is extraordinarily earthy, um, more so than usual. Normally when I'm adding sots into a beer, I'm getting a lot of spice and herbal character and some lemon. In this case, I'm getting a ton of earthiness and I'm getting uh, definitely a lot of that spice and that herbal character as well, but not so much of the lemon, which is interesting. And I'm wondering why that is. And as a result, the beer is slightly out of balance. It's skewed a little bit more towards the hops than the malt. Um, and 
while it's not necessarily a bad thing, it just makes it different than what I expected. I expected the maltiness on this beer to be kind of more front and center um, than it is. That being said, the malty flavor on the beer is excellent. It is very nutty, um, very toasty, but it's not toasty in the way of the other amber lager you see this time of year, the Meritzen Oktoberfest. That beer not only is substantially more sweet than this one's coming across, but it's also more rich bready. Uh, this is still getting that bread and that bread crust character in there from the decoction, but there's toastiness in this that is not present in the Meritzen Oktoberfest. Um, and also, there's a lot more yeast character in this one than a Meritzen Oktoberfest. I find those are a lot cleaner. Um, there's definitely a little bit of kind of yeast expression, I think, in this. I think it's heightened from the open fermentation. It's just slightly berry-like. There's absolutely zero caramel flavor in this, by the way, um, which is the way it should be. It's more of a dry, toasty character. Um, and I like that because oftentimes you get amber lagers that are chock full of caramel, and that's not for everyone, including me. There is a nice richness to this, and there is just a slight hint of tannin in there, <laughs> which when I describe it, generally puts people off because tannin is commonly referenced as an off flavor. But you're gonna get tannins from a decoction mash most of the time, just in very small quantities, and it adds a little tiny bit of character to the beer. It makes it feel a bit drier in the mouth. And sometimes that's a good thing. In excess, however, it is certainly not. But that's one of the reasons why we only do like a 15 minute boil on the decoction, so we don't extract too many tannins. Generally, the pH of the decoction mash is such that you're not going to really extract a lot of tannins in general when you're boiling the grain, but it's just something to be aware of. There's a really floral grassiness now that's coming out of this as it warms up a bit. As far as comparing the Weirman floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt with the Prostiov malts uh, Pilsner malt, I haven't really picked up on any serious differences here. Um, that being said, comparing an amber lager to a pale lager isn't really that good of a comparison for that sort of experiment. Um, so I'm not really gonna say conclusively one way or another if I prefer one. When it comes time for my final Czech beer in this series, which will be a really traditional Czech Pilsner, um, I am gonna use the Prostiov malts uh, just for the sake of authenticity. I just love the way the Prostiov Pilsner malt presented itself in the Czech pale lager I made, and I wanna chase that flavor even more for a Czech Pils. Nonetheless, this beer is really satisfying, and it's fun because it's not your typical amber lager for the fall, um, and it's nice to shake things up every so often. As far as potential improvements for this beer go, I would certainly recommend dialing back the flavor hops. What I'd recommend doing is honestly just removing the 15 minute addition entirely. That will drop the IBUs a little bit, but I think that's gonna work for the balance of the beer in a good way. There's just a little too much earthiness in here that really competes with the malt instead of complementing it. Um, and I'd rather have some of those wonderful malt flavors, that nuttiness specifically shining through. Uh, so that's my only recommendation. Otherwise, everything else worked out well. I actually like the way that the open fermentation introduced a little bit of yeast expression in there, um, which is cool. Uh, and you don't get that with lagers that often. And it's not to say that I'm purposefully fermenting my lagers dirty. That's not the case at all. What I'll say is the expressive yeast flavors that you get from an open fermentation are very different than the expressive yeast flavors you get from a stressed fermentation or just a poor fermentation. So keep that in mind uh, when you're thinking about open fermenting your lager. I like the way it worked out and I'll probably be doing that again. I think the best descriptor I have for the flavor coming off of this from the open fermentation is blueberry. I think that's exactly what that is. It's not prominent, it's really hard to nail down, um, but it's very complimentary to the malt, actually. Um, and I really like the way that that's worked out. It's really hard to describe this for people who can't taste the beer. It's really hard for me to figure out how to communicate that, yes, this lager is not clean, but it's still a fantastic lager. When everyone thinks that lager needs to be super clean, it's just got a very particular character to it that is very complimentary to the other flavors in the beer. And that's where I'm gonna leave it because I can't really do any better than that, I'm sorry. Just try it for yourself and see what happens. See what you think. Anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something and had a good time watching it. So if so, please go ahead, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below, please, also with your 
thoughts, your opinions on everything. I really do enjoy reading the comments and getting back to them. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts about this whole thing. If you want to help support the channel, I have a series of t-shirts. You can find this design and plenty of others on my merchandise store page, which is linked in the description box. Check it out if you're curious. All those proceeds go back into the channel and it helps quite a bit. If you want to help support the channel in other ways, I also have a Patreon. I'm going to be honest, guys. If not for Patreon, I probably would have quit this channel a long time ago. Patreon support is really, really important for keeping it moving, and I honestly cannot think of where I'd be right now without the Patreon support. So you have my utmost gratitude, and I really do appreciate your support. If Patreon is not your thing, though, there's still plenty of other ways to help support the channel, including channel memberships, and there's the Super Thanks button as well. All of that stuff goes right back into the channel, and it helps me keep this hobby moving forward. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check out my pages for some more frequent content updates, and you'll get an idea of what's coming to the channel in the very very near or very distant future. And that's all I got for you guys today. So I really appreciate you watching the whole video. It means a lot to me. Uh, you guys who are sticking around to the very end are the real MVPs. And this one goes out to you. So until the next one, Nizdravi.